For the call to worship this morning, we're going to read the Apostles' Creed. It's found in the very front page of your hymn Bibles, uh, hymnals. If you'll please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure I'm in order here. Yeah. Let's pray together. And let me just say, as we, as we pray, I want to do something just a, a little bit different. Uh, I often use a, an acronym, PRAY, P-R-A-Y, uh, to, for praise, repent, ask, and yield. And so we're going to do that this morning just as something different. There's going to be a verse up here. I'm going to read that first, and then I'm going to urge you to quietly praise uh, the Lord where you're sitting. Uh, at repent, I'm going to urge you to quietly repent where you're sitting. Then I'll close out each of those sections and we'll go to the next one. Uh, well, you won't have a lot of time to quietly do that this morning, a lot in the worship service, but I want to just uh, do something different in our prayer time this morning. So first, uh, praise. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. From where you're sitting, just quietly, praise the Lord for uh, just a moment this morning. Lord, it is good to give you praise, to even hear the praise of the children as they, their voices ring out in those quiet moments. And we praise you for every member of this church, from the youngest to the oldest, for everyone who has come this morning to worship, we praise you. Most of all, Lord, we praise you. We sing praise to you. We exalt your holy name as we come together in worship. Part of what we're doing, Lord, is telling again of all of your wonderful deeds and giving glory to your name for what you've done on our behalf. So, Lord, we come to praise you and to worship you this very day and every day. And now, Lord, we come to repent. Psalm 119 says, how can a young man or a young woman keep their way pure? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Take a moment to repent, to tell the Lord where, confess where you've not lived according to his word. Let's pray. Lord, we have all sinned, and we have all fallen short of your glory. But Lord, we rejoice that though our sins be many, that by the blood of Jesus you would cleanse us and wash us whiter than snow. Lord, we pray that in this time that you'd break our hearts for what breaks yours, that we would repent of not walking according to your word. Lord, reveal in each of our hearts 
where, as we've discussed in, in Sunday school, where we've let the enemy have a seat at our table. Lord, we repent of that. And we want to walk with you. We want to walk to sit, to sit with you. So forgive us and restore us in Jesus' name. And then we ask of the Lord, Psalm 5, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. Again, take a moment where you sit and pray for those needs of those you know and love and for your own needs. Lord, I'm sure we could spend many more minutes bringing before you friends and loved ones, maybe our own needs. But Lord, we, we would ask that you would indeed give ear to our words. That even if we didn't have words this morning, that you would remember our groaning and know in our groaning what our very need is. Lord, would you come to the point of our needs that we've lifted up to you? Heal our beloved brothers and sisters, our friends, our neighbors, our moms and our dads, our children. Come and restore them. Pray also for special wisdom for all these young parents. Lord, for the blessings of, of children. Well, Lord, give us wisdom to raise them in a godly way. Give us wisdom to model faith before these young children and before these teenagers. Lord, that in the season that we have them here with us and the season in which we can instruct them, that we would instruct them well and that you would draw them to yourself and they'd walk with you all their days, we would ask. We pray for the older members of our church, those who are, who are struggling. The life's just not easy. The pains become more every day. And we ask for your mercy and for your healing. Again, we pray for each one that's on our hearts. We entrust them to your tender care. And then finally, Lord, we yield unto you. Psalm 31 says, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. This is a time where you sit to just declare, Lord, I'm trusting in you. I'm yielding all these cares unto you. Lord, we do yield to you. We put our trust in you. We pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we pray that, it reminds us to pray the great prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You stand and sing with us. Build your kingdom here and the goodness of God.
for a time that's especially for you. <clears throat> well, good morning. Thank you for being patient. I know the prayer and everything took longer this morning, and you guys have sat patiently, so thank you uh, for, for doing that. It is good to, to see you. Come on, Grace, and join us. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, Dad can, Dad can join us, too. Absolutely. So, when I was a boy, sometimes we would take a towel if we didn't have anything else and tie it around us like this and what were we trying to do when we did that anybody got it huh be a superhero right and we'd go up into like the barn loft and jump off the loft and then watch this fly out like we were we had a lot of bells of hay and stuff underneath we weren't that high up but yeah it was like we were we wanted to be a superhero does anybody have a favorite superhero 
Anybody have one that you'd like? Don't have one? Spider-Man's pretty popular out here with some, some people these days. Captain America. Who, who else? Okay, Superman. Anybody like Superman? Nah? Any, any superheroes you guys want to name? Well, you know what? I was thinking about that. And uh, superheroes don't always wear a cape, whether it's a fake one or a, or, or a real one. Superheroes in our lives are often ordinary people uh, in our lives. Like, for me, my, some of my superheroes will always be my mom and my dad. Uh, they're, just, they're just heroes uh, in my life and always uh, special to me. There were times we didn't get along so well, but, but they were always through it all right there for me. So maybe you have heroes like that. Maybe a grandma or grandpa uh, is a superhero in your life. Well, during Children's Church, you're going to learn about a special hero named Esther. Her, her name is Esther. Uh, she was married to a king named King Xerxes. And Esther was a Jewish lady. Uh, here, here's just a picture in this children's Bible of Esther, and that's uh, her relative Mordecai. Uh, and then here's the king. The king wanted a bride, and they went out to find a bride for her, and she was the most beautiful woman uh, in the land, and he fell in love with her uh, and married her. But then something happened. Uh, the king had a guy that worked for him named Haman, and he hated the Jewish people, and Esther was a, was a Jewish lady. And he, he came up with this plot uh, to try to destroy uh, all the Jewish people. And I'm telling the short version of it. You'll learn more about it downstairs. But Mordecai, her relative, learned about it and went to Esther and said, you got to go talk to the king. you got to let him know what's going on. Uh, you're here for such a time as this. There's a reason that, that uh, you're here. There's a reason you're married to the king. But Esther was afraid. Did you know in that day, in that kingdom, no one could go visit the king unless he invited them? If he didn't invite them, uh, they were in trouble. They could be punished. In some cases, they even died for going to see the king when they weren't supposed to. But you could go, and if the king thought it was okay, he would extend his scepter to say, it's okay, you're invited to come. Well, Esther, was, even though he was, she was married to the king, she was afraid to go. So what she did is she got the Jewish people to fast, which is to do without food, for three days, and then they all prayed that she would be able to go and tell what was going on. And you know what? She went, even though she was afraid, she went, she told the king, the king stopped this evil plot to kill all the Jewish people. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty amazing, aren't they? I think she's a superhero. And you're going to learn more about Esther this morning. Uh, you're going to learn that she was there at just the right time to save the people. And, and that God's always working behind the scenes. Even when we can't see him working, God's always working. Isn't that good? So let's pray together and thank God that he's always working, okay? Dear God, thank you for always working. Help us trust you, even when we cannot see you working. Not see you working. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your help this morning. We'll let Britt get settled at the piano, but I also want to remind you, I'm going to start this new song out for us to learn, but when we get to the third verse and we talk about being raised with Christ, would you raise yourself right up and sing with me at that time? I appreciate it so much. Abide.
Well, thank you. Absolutely beautiful. Perfect, perfect song uh, for today. Wow. Well, let's pray together. Lord, teach us indeed to abide, to abide in you, to depend upon you, To not wait till we're at the end of our resources, but to depend on you always. Lord, teach us to have a deeper union with you. Come to us now as we read and as I proclaim your holy word, send your spirit upon us. That the words we read, the words I speak would inspire us, would change us, would would move in such a way that we give you more glory and again that we draw closer into union with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we jammed a lot in the service with the uh, prayer time and such, but um, no worries. I've heard with turning the clocks back, I've got an extra hour to preach uh, anyway, so don't, don't worry about it. John uh, 15, verses 1 through 11, and I promise you I won't go that long. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Thanks be to God for His holy word. (laughs) Amen. (coughs) Excuse me. Well, we considered the opening verses of John chapter 15 in the I Am series that I shared, oh, about a year and a half or so ago. Now, today I really want to focus in on the word abide 
uh, which we first encounter, encounter in verse 4. But before we get there, I want to remind you of a few things we, uh, we saw before. First, Jesus says in verse 1 that he is the true vine. Now, Israel had been the channel through which God's covenant blessings flowed to the world. They had been the vine. And according to Jeremiah 2.21, God had planted Israel as a choice vine. But they had turned degenerate, and they had become a wild vine. Israel had proven at this point to be fruitless and unfaithful. Oh, some were faithful. There were still a faithful remnant, but generally speaking, they were not. But Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the one who is faithful. I'm the one who will bring salvation and blessings to the people. I will bring salvation and blessings to your lives. As John MacArthur writes, Jesus is the true vine in the same sense that he is the true light that he is the final and complete revelation of spiritual truth. He's the true bread of heaven, the final and only source of spiritual sustenance. Verse 1 also says that God the Father is the vine dresser. And vine dresser at its roots means uh, someone who tills the land. Uh, it basically means a farmer. So it refers to someone who would plant and fertilize and, and water the crops. But verse 2 focuses in on two responsibilities of the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. A vine dresser removes branches that do not bear fruit, so they will, they will not draw nutrients away from the vine and those branches that are bearing fruit. Second, a vine dresser prunes the branches so that those branches that are already bearing fruit will bear even more fruit. And that is, of course, referring to God disciplining us. He, he's removing anything that would hinder us from our spiritual growth. He's removing anything that would prevent us from living fruitful lives in accordance with his word and his way. And the key to bearing fruit is found in the word abide, beginning in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If I count it correctly, if you look through verses 4 through 10, the word abide appears uh, at least 10 times. Jesus is serious about our abiding in him, or as the New International Version has it, remaining in him. And the Greek word meno describes something that remains where it's at, that it's fixed, that it endures. A branch remains fixed to the vine so that the vine can provide life. You see, the vine provides the sustenance and the strength and the immunity and the resilience that the branch needs. And the result, if we remain, is that we will have a fruitful and abundant life. Jesus is using this imagery to remind us that we need an unbroken communion with himself, the vine. Jesus is the one that you and I are going to receive sustenance from. He's the one that's going to give us strength and resilience. He's the one that's going to give us an abundant life, so we must remain in him. But what does it really mean to abide in Christ? We often speak of it in terms of having faith in Jesus, and that's a good thing. We must have faith in Christ. We must trust the vine. We also speak of abiding as uh, having a relationship with Jesus. We're fond of saying that Christianity is not so much a religion, but a relationship, and that's true. But counselor and speaker and author John Eldridge has, I believe, rightly helped me see that 
there's something deeper going on here than connection or faith or even deeper than relationship. Some of you may be familiar with John Eldridge. He and his wife Stacy wrote uh, some really great books at the beginning, around early 2000, that a lot of the evangelical Christian world was reading. The books, Wild at Heart uh, and Captivating. Those two books helped all of us learn a lot about, well, the opposite sex. But before the pandemic, John Eldridge wrote a book titled, Get Your Life Back. Get Your Life Back. Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. And then he followed that after the pandemic with the book Resilient, Restoring Your Weary Soul in These Turbulent Times. In the first book, he shared that the world really is mad, (laughs) that the world really is chaotic, and we need practices which will restore our lives. In the second book, he chronicles that not only was the world already mad, but then we added to that madness the intense trauma of COVID-19 and all the physical, political, social, and even spiritual upheaval that went with it, and we're desperately in need of restoration. In fact, the argument is is that the signs of what we went through are only now showing up in many people's lives. What we need now, he says, is to abide in Christ. But it's more than connection. It's more than faith. He suggests it's union with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He writes, it's a good thing to have faith in Christ. But you can have faith without much personal experience. You can hold to a certain religious faith and actually, know, and actually not know God yourself. He goes on to say, I have faith in my surgeon, but I don't know him at all. We certainly don't share our life together. I'm grateful for his help, but we aren't anything like best of friends. Likewise, he says, we can have faith in God from a distance. We can have a relationship with Christ, but not really be intimate. We can even at some level be intimate, but not have union with Christ. Intimacy with Christ might be your hands pressed together as if you were praying that you're intimate with Christ. You you know Christ. But union's going to be with your fingers down like this. Your life is intertwined with Christ. In fact, your life is so intertwined with Christ that you know you can do nothing apart from Him. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. An engine is made to run, we'd say gasoline, he said petrol. And it will not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed upon. In other words, you and I were made for union with Christ. And Jesus at the very least least hints at this when he tells us to abide in him. But then he ups the ante in his prayer in John chapter 17. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. It's remarkable. Jesus prayed that we would have the kind of union with him that he has with the Father. That he would be in us as God is in him. Now, please don't understand me. I'm not in any way claiming an equivalency with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And this side of heaven, will, our sinfulness will never allow a complete union with Christ. But there is no denying that Jesus is praying that you and I would have a deeper union with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? How do we abide in Christ? How, how do we have that deeper union? Well, Jesus tells us one way in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. One way we remain attached to the vine, one way we go deeper in our union with God is by reading and studying and meditating on the Scriptures. And the evangelical world, in America at least, has given us the discipline of having a quiet time. And ever since I trusted in Jesus as my Savior, I have, to varying degrees of success, tried to have a quiet time with Jesus. It's a good discipline. But you know what? If we're not careful, it can just become a matter of checking off another task. Okay, Lord, I, I had my devotion. I had my Bible reading. I had my Jesus time this morning. Check, I'm done. A quiet time of Scripture reading and meditating and prayer is wonderful. I highly recommend that all of us set aside such a time. But union with Christ, beloved, is more than checking off a time once a day. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, and the word keep means keep and keep on keeping, that you stay walking with him. He said in John 8, 31 to 32, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I think Eldridge is again correct when he asserts that what's at stake here is this question. What is the story you are living in? Who is writing the narrative of your life? Who is writing the narrative of your life? Is CNN or Fox News or social media or politics or the economy or job stress or illness? or your children, or your spouse writing your narrative? Or is Jesus writing your narrative? Is Jesus and His truth absolutely central to everything you say and do? You see, in this world, there's always going to be competing narratives. There's always going to be stories that's going to try to drive us away from God's Word and a biblical worldview and the story that God tells? Is your life so saturated with God's truth that your emotional and spiritual state reflects that God is in control? That God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in control of my life. And I'm going to seek to reflect that every day. Do you have such a union with Christ that you understand that every breath you're given, every breath, is given because Christ is ruling. Do you understand that every sunrise and sunset comes because Christ is ruling? Do we understand that the ocean teems and the earth crawls with creatures because Christ is ruling? As Eldridge writes, the story of God, the story of Jesus Christ has been, is now, and always will be the story of the world. But is he your story? Is he your story? Are you moving into a deeper union with Jesus? Because we're such busy people, uh, Eldridge goes on to recommend that we have a, a one-minute pause every day, uh, at least at the beginning of our day and at the end of our day before we go to bed, but throughout the day. 
And as with everything, there is an app that you can download. It's available for your one-minute pause. You can do a five-minute pause, or you can do a one-minute pause, or you can do uh, the one I've just recently been doing, a 30 days to resilience, which is uh, about 10 to 15 minutes twice a day. But it's not about an app or a program. It's not about just checking off some time with Jesus. The goal, beloved, is a deeper union with God. And I just want to share some simple practices that I've been learning, and I've just recently been learning these, and I'm still growing in these myself, but they've been helping me move towards a deeper union with God. One is related to our understanding of who's in control. And it's the practice of pausing at least twice a day, but anytime you're just overwhelmed and saying, Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. This is not abdicating our responsibilities, but in this age of instant news and seeing and hearing about everyone's problems, including our own, We need a time, even if it's just for a few moments every day, to acknowledge that we're not God and we're not in control. We cannot save the world. Therefore, we declare, Lord, I give you everyone and everything. And then we might go on to list the things we're giving to the Lord. Lord, I give you my children. Lord, I give you that big meeting coming up at work. Lord, I give you my illness. It's not foolproof. And like any discipline, it can become a ritual. But it's a moment to say, I'm going to abide in Jesus. I'm going to abide in the vine. I'm going to acknowledge that apart from him, I can't do anything. I need this union with you, Lord. I'm not in control. In fact, I'm in control of less than I think I'm in control of. And then another thing we might do in in a one-minute pause just throughout your day to keep that union is to declare, I love you, God. Just simply say, I love you, God. And we could go to the Psalms. We could read a lot of language there about love, and that's great. But to pause throughout our day and say, I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love you. I love you. I love you. That pause throughout the day can make all the difference in that sense of union with Christ to declare again and again, I love you, Lord. I don't love you enough, but I love you. And I want to love you more. There are many other suggestions for a one-minute pause, but one that, that I have found uh, most helpful uh, that I'm going to share with you, Mitt, if you want to know more, you can read the books or download the app if, if you find this kind of thing helpful. But something that helps me is noticing beauty. Noticing beauty. One that helps me is noticing the beauty of creation. Do you know that some research shows that patients recover faster, they need fewer pain medicines, they leave the hospital sooner if their windows allow a view of nature? Nature, or what I prefer to call creation, draws us into a deeper union with God. So some mornings when when I get up, and I get here at the church, and the, the some mornings I'm here as the sun is coming up, and we have some of the most beautiful sunrises around. If you want to come in and just park in the parking lot and look out over the town, they're absolutely gorgeous. And sometimes when I look at those and I look at the, the purples and the pinks and the blues, and I just stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for making something so beautiful. I need a deeper union with you because I'm not in control. I can't do that. Thank you, Lord. And sometimes it's the sunset that I notice and praise Him for. Sometimes especially, especially when they're not watching me, I notice the beauty of my wife. 
and the beauty of my children and the beauty of my grandchildren and the beauty of you all and your children. And I say thank you, Lord. Especially when I think about my family, I say, wow, God, you, you did this for me? You put these beautiful ladies in my life? I don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. I'm so glad I wasn't in control of that. I'd have messed it up. I want to be in a deeper union with you. For you, it might be a beautiful painting or some other work of art. It might be an engineering or technological marvel that draws you in and you just pause and you, you say, God, I, I know you gave the gift of creativity. I, I know you gave all this knowledge. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for these amazing people with all these talents that you've put into our lives. Don't get hung up, beloved, on a particular practice. But I believe a deeper union with Christ is what God is calling us into. He wants us to have more of those daily moments when you and I just acknowledge, Lord, I'm a branch. I'm just a branch, Lord. I can't do anything apart from you. So draw me in to a deeper union with you. Help me this day, Lord, this moment, to abide in you. Let's pray together. Lord, draw us into a deeper union with you. Help us see that we can't even take our next breath apart from you. If you give us our breath, we leave, if, live. If you take it away, we die. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, give us more of those moments when we're willing to say, Lord, I surrender it to you. I give you everything. I give you everyone. I can't let go of it completely, but in these moments, I'm just going to let go of it for a little while and acknowledge that you're in control, Lord. Help us throughout our day, Lord, to stop and to realize how much you love us and how much we want to love you. Help us to, to just pause, even if it's for a minute, and declare, I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you. And then, Lord, give us those moments. There's going to be a moment of beauty when we move today after worship. There's a moment of beauty now as we're here together. Keep us from missing those moments. Open our eyes to them. May they cause us to declare you're in control, Lord. And we want a deeper union with you. We are but branches. You are the vine. Apart from you, we can do nothing. So may we abide in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join us in your closing hymn today. I surrender all. We'll sing verse 1, 3, and 4. I surrender all.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.